And so by now you're probably in Ephesians chapter 4, and we are going to finish the fourth chapter of Ephesians. We've been journeying through this book for quite some time now, and we've been really slowing down, going almost verse, one verse at a time uh, through this passage. And today we're actually going to uh, cover a, a chunk of this passage and finish chapter 4 uh, all in one go. Now, uh, it, just for context, what Paul is saying in this section of the letter of, to the church in Ephesus, uh, he is encouraging us to live like Christians, which is probably a good thing to do when you're writing a letter to churches of Christians in a city. He's writing to these people in Ephesus. Ephesus was a port city. It was highly influenced by the culture, and it was very culturally influenced, globally influential. Uh, there, were a lot of, uh, wor there was a lot of worship of false gods and all kinds of different deities and religions in Ephesus and all kinds of cultural influence. And Paul is writing this letter to the Christians in Ephesus saying, hold fast onto your faith. Don't let the culture of the world influence you. And because of all of these cultural influences, I'm going to remind you who you are in Christ, and then I'm going to tell you how you should live because of who you are in Christ. So now we're in this, uh, coming into, we're in the second half of the letter, and we're coming into the end of what we call chapter four, even though Paul didn't write it with chapters and verse breaks. He was just writing a letter to the churches. But as we know, the end of chapter four, he is telling us really what feels like this kind of New Testament set of Proverbs. There's a couple of places in Scripture, like the book of James is a really good example of that, of places that feel almost similar to reading the book of Proverbs. Here's some practical advice for living. Like it gets so practical that last week when Danny was preaching, he told us, hey, don't steal. Like, that's good practical advice. Don't steal. Uh, I love how it, it just happened to line up that that was the passage that Danny could preach uh, to a bunch of, with, uh, with all the young people graduating college uh, or, and high school, right? Hey, if you're going to go out into the world, you graduated from high school, you're going into college, hey, don't steal. That's, that's good graduation Sunday uh, sermon content, right? So it just worked out perfectly. Well, today we're going to finish this passage with some more practical stuff. It's going to feel a bit like a chunk. I promise you there is a theme that's going to unify all of this together. We'll get that uh, get to that by the end. But let's start by reading again the context that we are digging into. Starting in verse 25, which is really the, the chunk we've been studying, it says, therefore, Putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. So just by way of review, over the last several weeks, we've heard Paul tell us, tell the truth. Uh, he's told us to, when you're angry, don't sin. We talked about that, and then last week, uh, Danny told us to be generous instead of being stingy or stealing from other people. And then today, we're going to let Paul finish his encouragement with three more pieces of advice that are all tied together in this passage, starting in verse 29. Paul says, no foul language should come from your, your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So we're going to take each of these individually, and then at the end of this, we're going to see if we can find a theme. So as I'm sharing each of these individual points with you, uh, I, I want to see if you can get to the unifying theme before I tell you what it is. So that's, that's your challenge. Uh, let's see if you can figure it out as we go. Uh, but here is the first point for the day. We would just say Paul is telling us to speak life. Listen again to verse 29. This is where we get this idea. It says, No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. Now, for the record, I just want to tell you right off the bat, Paul is not actually making a simple prohibition on words your mom told you not to say. When he says no foul language, he's not actually then going to offer, and here is the list of all the cuss words. 
right? He's actually not saying that simple of a point. Now, you, you can have a conversation with your mom about all the cuss words and all the things that you're not allowed to say in your house. Paul's actually not just making that simple of a point. Now, I have reason to believe that uh, part of this is probably inspired by the Holy Spirit, even if Paul wasn't aware of it at the time, that we would understand from our perspective that language is cultural and universal, right? That, that there's language around the world and there's shared ideas around the world. Like every, every language has a word and a concept for expressions of love and things that are positive and good and life-giving, just like every language and culture has expressions for things that are taboo and should not be said in mixed company. Or if you want to get uh, have a good reputation in society, it'd be good if you don't say these words. And what's interesting is if you travel around the world, even in one generation, if you go into, like, say, the South in America, the things that are acceptable to be said might be different than in, in the South in California. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if you go over to the UK, if you go to Great Britain, there's actually different standards of what is and is not allowed to be said in in Great Britain. In, in fact, I know some Americans who've gone over to England and heard the way Christian people talk in England, and they go, wow, they're so much more loose with their language. It's like there's no rules over there, which is funny because you would think America would be the wild, wild west, and we just say whatever we want. But the point that I'm trying to make for you is that language is culturally specific. And so what's not appropriate to say here isn't necessarily inappropriate to say somewhere else and vice versa. And so it's actually to our benefit that Paul doesn't waste his time giving us a list of the things good New Testament early church Christians cannot say. Because by the time we get to America in 2023, the list has changed. In fact, the things that I was never allowed to say when I was 10 are way different now that I'm 38. Not just because I've become an adult or because I've just run my life and run my mouth now, but because culture is shifting and changing. Like there was a day that I would get fired from being a pastor if I said the word shoot in a sermon. And I'm standing here in converse in jeans telling you that. Like, so culture changes. You understand that, right? So it's good that Paul didn't get bogged down into a cultural moment, which also tells us that he's telling us something deeper than just here's a list of bad potty words that you should never say. See, Paul's actually addressing the, not just the specific words that we say, but the purpose of our words. Right? This sounds more like Paul now. He's not just going to give us a list of words that Ten years later are going to be different words. We've got to constantly update the list of bad words that Christians can't say. He's, what Paul's interested in is the state of our heart, right? He's interested in the condition of our heart. He wants to know, are you going to say something worthwhile? So it turns out that Paul's advice to us is more along the lines of the advice that you all heard the first time you watched Bambi. Right? The great theologian Mrs. Rabbit told his, her son, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. This is more like what Paul is trying to communicate to us. I'm not going to give you a list of words never to say. I'm going to focus your attention on saying something that comes from the heart of kindness and goodness. Does this make sense? Now, why is this? The reason Paul is interested not in giving us a list of, pro, uh, uh, of potty words, words we can't say, but talking to us about the heart of our speech is because the purpose of our speech should be focused on building others up. Paul doesn't want to waste his time telling you bad words. He's saying, let me spend my energy telling you how to speak life. This is what's important. Speak life into those around you. Not words that tear others down or build yourself up at the expense of others. Paul's telling us to think about other people before we think about ourselves and to use words that build others up. Paul is inviting us to remember that your words have incredible power. Do you remember on the playground when you learned the old axiom, sticks and stones can break my bones, but 
What a load of garbage. That's absolutely wrong. I would just like to go on the record, and I'd like this to stand for the rest of my life. So don't come and change this now. I have never been in a fist fight. Please don't change that. I'd like that to be the case for my, the rest of my life. So I, I, I've, I've, I've actually never had someone throw rocks at me for the purpose of uh, trying to physically harm me. I did when I was a kid one time. Uh, I, was, I was taking, you know, those white rocks that you have for, like, landscaping. I was, I was using it as chalk on m the driveway at my mom's house when I was a kid. And my brother was standing further up the driveway, and he was bouncing the rocks because this is the things that old, older brothers do. He was bouncing the rocks to see if he could get it to bounce over me while I was down on the, and I just want you to know that he failed miserably. <laughs> he did not get the rock to bounce over me. He David and goliath me. While I was down on, on my knees, I just see this, this white missile of death bouncing off of the driveway and flying right up and hitting me in the forehead. And I had blood running all down my face, and my brother was trying to figure out whether or not he felt bad or he was supposed to laugh. And so I know that rocks can hurt. But I'll, I'll tell you, even though I've never been in a real fist fight, I've wrestled an older brother. I've never had anybody hit me with a stick that I can remember. I've been hit with a rock on the forehead, and I survived. I lived to tell the tale. But I have never been more wounded than by somebody's words. And I don't think you have either. I have never been more torn down by words. Words that were designed to hurt or words that were withheld that would have built me up. I have never been more wounded by somebody's words or, or by anything other than somebody's words. See, your words have power. Danny referenced this verse for us last week, and it's a verse that is really core to our culture here at Life Church. that we remember that Proverbs 18 and 21 says, death and life is in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. In other words, the words that you say will produce the kinds of things that you see in your life. That doesn't mean that you have magic powers in your mouth. It just means that what you say tends to end up happening, Right? If you say terrible things all the time, you end up having a pretty terrible life. In other words, in short, your words, what you say, has incredible power. And the book of James, James would agree with this, and he warns of the destructive power of our words. In the third chapter of his letter, he says, The tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of unrighteousness. It's placed among our members. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and it's set on fire by hell. Wow. Happy Father's Day. Super encouraging. So every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With a tongue we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. By the way, we reconcile the idea that, that James tells us that no one can tame the tongue by understanding that the point is not to try to behavior manage our way out of saying bad words, which is, again, why Paul doesn't give us a list. James's response, if we say, well, if no one can tame the tongue, what's the hope? James's response would be, then give your heart fully over to Christ, and he will change what comes out of your mouth by changing what's in your heart. Right? After all, Jesus taught his disciples, out of the heart the mouth speaks. Right? So since our words have so much power, this is why Paul urges us to only use words for, quote, what is good for building someone up in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. So instead of using foul speech or selfish speech or demeaning speech or speech that's designed to uh, tear someone down in comparison of how much it makes us look good, instead of using that kind of speech, would you take Mike Foster's challenge to speak words that rebuild the torn down places in each other? 
This should be the goal, the drive of our speech. I recognize that in my mouth I have something incredibly powerful. I could use it to destroy you, or I could use it to build up the places that have been broken in you by the world. At the very least, we should think before we speak, right? Proverbs 29, 20 says, do you see someone who speaks too soon? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Think before you speak. Slow down. We would be really wise to adopt the rule for our speech of the missionary to India, Amy Carmichael, who said, let nothing be about uh, let nothing be said about anyone unless it passes through these three sieves. Is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary? That's a good rule for life, right? Is it true? Like, does this agree with God's truth? Is it kind? And is it necessary? It's funny how I, I've gotten to true and I could probably turn it into something kind and still have to deal with is it necessary? Oh, yeah, I probably talk too much. I'll just be quiet. Right? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Not do I want to say this. Not will people think I'm smart if I say this. Which, by the way, there's that old famous quote that goes something like a person can be counted wise or maybe you think a person might not be smart and then they can open up their mouth and remove all doubt. Right? You're not sure if a person has a brain in their head until they start talking. You go, oh, yeah, no, you don't. Okay. Maybe lots of people would think that we're a lot smarter if we would actually obey Scripture and remember that we'll be counted wise. Just keep your mouth shut. Right? So, Paul says, speak life. This is what you should do if you are going to live like a Christian. Use your words to build others up. Build the kingdom up inside of them. And then the second point that Paul encourages, and I would even call this maybe a warning he offers to us, is he would say what I'm going to call stay sealed as a challenge and even a warning for us. Paul writes in verse 30, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Now, notice that Paul tells us what kind of person is able to grieve the Holy Spirit. The kind of person that can grieve the Holy Spirit is a person who has been sealed by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the person that grieves the Holy Spirit is a Christian doing something very specific. When a Christian person sins, then you are grieving the Holy Spirit. So the reality is that people who are outside of a relationship with God don't have to worry about whether or not they're grieving the Holy Spirit. In fact, I heard one pastor say, you don't grieve the Holy Spirit if you're not in Christ. You're just at odds with him. So Paul's talking to the church when he says, he's talking to you and me. We are the ones who have the ability to grieve the Holy Spirit. And Paul ties grieving the Spirit to being sealed with him for a very important person, uh, for a, a, an important reason. Because we grieve the Holy Spirit when we who have been sealed live as if we have not been sealed. Scripture calls this deliberate sin. Those who know better, but sin anyway. And so the question is, why does this sort of thing grieve the Holy Spirit? And, and by the way, I, I'm not going to get bogged down into the argument of can you lose your salvation and, and can, you, can you walk away? We, oh, I, I will come back around with a proposal for you in that. We won't uh, unpack that whole idea theologically right now. But I, I'll give you a little bit of a, of a hint in what I think Scripture actually teaches on this and why Paul would say it grieves the Holy Spirit when Christians sin. In Hebrews chapter 10... Starting in verse 26, it says, For if we deliberately go on sinning after the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. Again, this is written to people who have placed their faith in Christ. In other words, people who have been sealed by God for salvation. And what does the author of Hebrews say? If you keep going, go on sinning, if you continue to deliberately, willfully sin after you have placed your faith in Christ, what can you expect? Not heaven. 
Verse 28, he goes on, anyone who disregarded the law of Moses died without mercy based on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He says, if that's true in the Old Testament, he says, how much worse punishment do you think one will deserve who is trampled on the Son of God, who is regarded as profane the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Now, this sounds really, really harsh. If you've placed your faith in Christ, you are spiritually alive. But every time you, after salvation, choose to sin, you're inviting death back into your life. And the author of Hebrews goes so far as to say, you're not just making a simple choice. It's like you're taking the sacrificial death of Jesus on the cross, all of the punishment and pain, and saying, Jesus, I don't care about any of that. I trample on that so that I can do what I want right now in this moment. And I am driving this point home for us because it would be really, really good if the church would remember that Christians can still sin and that matters. I think so often we think that, look, I gave my life to Jesus. All my problems are solved. Now I can do whatever the heck I want. (gasps) He said heck in church. Remember point one. Isn't it crazy? (laughs) Isn't it crazy the things that we think matter and then we, so that we can go do whatever we want? Like we'll, we'll go, well, you better get your words right. You better say the right thing. You better act the right way. And then, and then over here, well, after Sunday's over, I'm going to do whatever I want. Right? Or temptation comes up in your life and you justify. You, go, I just, you know, God will understand. This is the second thing that we do. We either justify our sin or we actually put so much weight on the forgiveness of God in an, in an inappropriate way that we say, well, God has to forgive me. I'll just, you know, repent later. So we actually trick ourselves into thinking we can get away with sin because of God's grace. And friends, I want you to understand, the grace and the love and the forgiveness of God is is never-ending for the repentant, not for the manipulative. And there's a distinction there. Church, it is really, really important that we take sin seriously. And the author of Hebrews seems to go so far as to say, if you regularly practice sin, you're not in the kingdom of God. Now, I told you that we'll wrestle very briefly with the question of, uh, can you lose your salvation? So there's two schools of thought. One school of thought says, you came into the kingdom of heaven by your free will, and God did not take your free will away from you when you came into the kingdom. And so if you have free will, you chose to get into the kingdom by your choice, and you can choose to walk out of the kingdom. That's one school of thinking. The other school of thinking says things like, uh, God will never lose one of his children out of his grip. And once you're saved, you're always saved no matter what. And then we would go, well, what do you do with people who fall away from their faith? Well, the, the, the answer on the other extreme would say, well, that person was never actually saved in the first place. So there's two schools of thinking. On one, one extreme, once saved, always saved. And if you fall into habitual sin and you walk away from your faith, well, you were never saved in the first place. And the other school of thinking is you came in by free will. You can leave whenever you want by free will. Now, wherever you land on that spectrum, And it's not worth the time to tell you all the reasons why I land where I land on that spectrum. Just to say, wherever you land on that spectrum, can I just give you some advice? Don't test it. It actually doesn't matter who's right in that debate. It matters not at all. Both sides of that argument, everywhere in between, everyone who's coming to that conversation in good faith is trying to get you to understand one thing. Sin matters. It doesn't matter if you can lose your salvation or not and you were never actually saved or you can walk away whenever you... Eternally speaking, it doesn't matter. The question is about your heart. So just don't test it. If you want to go to Bible college, I can recommend a really good class in a great university that you can go to and take a class that will break down a Pentecostal theology of whether or not you can lose your salvation. But today, I'm telling you, friends, just don't play around with sin. Hebrews 10 tells us, take it seriously, because when you 
sin deliberately, you are grieving the heart of God. Why? You are grieving the heart of God because you're either a person who has said, I've accepted Jesus, but you've deceived yourself and you never actually did because you're just doing whatever you want. Or on the other side, you're a person who has come into the kingdom and you are at risk of losing what you gained. However you swing it, it doesn't matter. The point that matters is your salvation is dependent on your faith in Christ alone, which isn't just belief. It's not just I feel a thing. It's the way you live. Obey God. Stop sinning. And I know like, it sounds a little bit like, I'm, oh, you came to church today. Let me beat you up over your head and tell you what a terrible sinner you are. No, no, no. If anything, friends, the church has failed you over years to tell you that if you come to church once a month, that you're just a good person and you get to heaven. And that is not what gets us to heaven. So for all the ways that you've been done a disservice and thought that if I just attend church on a regular basis and I sing the songs, maybe I memorize a couple of them, and if they ever tell us to pray anything, I'll kind of like mutter the words, and I'll tell people that I'm a Christian, and I'll vote the right way, and I'll look the right way, and I'll do the right thing, and I'll certainly never cuss, at least not in public. Then I'll get into heaven. Friends, you were lied to. It's so much deeper than that. It's so much deeper than that. And I propose to you that all the things we spend so much energy worrying about, what do you think about once saved, always saved? What's your list of cuss words you're not allowed to say? All the things we worry about kind of work themselves out if you just give your heart fully to Christ. Because you begin to realize what's actually most important is just don't sin. Just be righteous. Live more like Jesus tomorrow than you did today. So the Holy Spirit is grieved when Christians sin because we're choosing death over life. Ugh. It's as if we're saying the sacrifice of Christ means nothing. And then Paul goes on to say this is actually what it looks like when you make that choice. And he he says, um, if we come back all the way to verse 31, he says this this is what it looks like. And he's doing it in a way of saying don't do these things. In verse 31, he says, Let all bitterness and anger and wrath and shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. So what he's saying here is the kind of people who are grieving the Holy Spirit are those who say Christ is their Savior, but they haven't removed bitterness from their life or anger or wrath or shouting and slander and malice. Okay, so let's make sure we understand what these things are. Bitterness, just very briefly, just w- let's walk through what, what it would look like to be the kind of person that grieves the Holy Spirit. So then we can get on to the good stuff again. So bitterness would be what we would call a sustained offense against another person, right? Uh, it's actually the only thing that Scripture says that is a sin that has a root. We have to unroot or uproot uh, bitterness from our hearts. Anger, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. We know anger is an emotion. The issue isn't with the emotion. It's what do you do with the emotion? Do you hang on to it or do you release it to God? And then we seem to actually have Paul tying anger and wrath together. Wrath seems to be not only just an extreme version of anger, but wrath is I'm pouring my anger out on you. And for the record, there's only one being in all of existence who has the right to be able to do anything with wrath other than surrender it, and that is God. Himself, because He is perfect and holy in His anger, not against you, but against sin. Right? Okay, so get rid of that. Don't be bitter. If there's somebody who's offended you, get rid of it. Well, how do I do that? You need to learn to forgive them. We'll talk about forgiveness in a minute, but just so you know, you know that you have released bitterness when you can pray a blessing for somebody, like you can ask God to bless a person and you actually mean it. And you know that you mean it if when God answers your prayer and that person is blessed, your first reaction is praise the Lord, not ah. Right? So get bitterness out of your life. If you have anger, don't move on to wrath. Release that to God. Don't shout. I know I shout at you sometimes when I preach, but that's not the kind of shouting he's talking about. (laughs) 
Uh, this this, this sh shouting is anger verbalized. That's, that's what we're talking about. When you take what is the anger that is in you and you verbalize it. Now, what's interesting about shouting is that sometimes you're shouting at the person you're not even angry at. Right? We call that projection, when I'm projecting what's going on with me and somebody else onto you. That's unhealthy. A lot of us do this to our children when we are unhealthy, or our coworkers, or essentially shouting is the, the version of, of sin and anger that we tend to do with the people we think we can get away with it with. Right? And so let's get rid of that. No shouting. What do you do when you feel like you want to shout? All good answers. Yeah, just don't, right? Breathe. Don't shout. Shut up. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I stopped being a shouter. I, I was a really angry person for a long time in my younger years. In fact, Sharon will tell you, when we were first together, I was a shouter. Ugh, I'm embarrassed about this, but this was true. I projected my anger onto Sharon about my own brokenness and all kinds of other ways in my life. And until I got healed of my own brokenness, I would just blow up verbally, just shout. And I like do words for life, like for a job. So I'm good with words. So a person who's good with words, who's a shouter, is a dangerous person, right? I'm gonna thank God for a good wife who stood by me while I was getting healed and told me to shut up in some really loving ways sometimes. Slander is when we make false accusations about a person telling lies about another person's character or actions in order to make them look bad. Slander is least verbalized now. It's mostly typed with your thumbs. Slander is the domain of social media. Um, slander is the thing that's going to happen a ton over the next year as we move to a, towards a presidential election. Um, slander is the thing that you're tempted to do about the person who hurt you when it comes up in conversation, right? So it's not just something they do, it's something we do every time we don't honor a person with our words. And then malice is the intention or desire to do evil, right? Like if you're a sports fan, you remember malice at the palace. Uh, you, this was, there was an intention for basketball players to do evil to the guy that threw a beer to the, into the, anyway, okay, watch the ESPN. Malice is when what's going on in your heart turns into schemes and plans. Malice is when you start having ideas about a person's demise. Malice is the thing that uh, if you've ever been so angry at a person that you've imagined what it would be like if that person came to ruin or came to some kind of pain, right? Malice, wishing harm on a person. And so what does Paul say? Get rid of these. Why? Because these are all behaviors not only that grieve the Holy Spirit, but they ruin relationship and destroy lives. Paul warns us to avoid these things. And then he moves right on to his, his next point, which is the final point for us. He says, instead of doing that, instead of tearing people down, instead of having all of this negativity and anger and wrath and malice and shouting and slander, instead of that, our third point, the way we'll phrase it for the purpose today would be share the kingdom. This is what Paul says uh, if you go back to verse 32. He says, and be kind. So get bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander removed from you along with all malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God forgave you. Now notice that Paul doesn't just simply say receiving God's kindness and compassion and forgiveness. He doesn't say, hey, don't be a hateful person. Receive the grace of Jesus. He says, don't be a hateful person. Give the grace of Jesus. I like, because you can't get to give unless you've received. So Paul just jumps straight to the ultimate conclusion. How do I know you've received the grace and forgiveness? If you give it, if you can give it away. Jesus made it very, very clear, by the way, that forgiveness, for example, is a requirement of being in his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 6, he says, if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. I mean, that's serious. How serious does God take forgiveness or withholding forgiveness? That's a matter of life and death. And then Jesus' expectation, by the way, is not simply just for forgiving, 
Remember, Paul tells us be kind and compassionate as well. And Jesus has something to say about that in Matthew chapter 25. He's telling us what it's going to be like when people get to heaven and how we know who has made it into heaven. Starting in verse 34, Jesus is he's giving an example to, to the people who make it into heaven. He's saying, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And Jesus says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You realize we are a part of a kingdom where God considers the most disenfranchised in our culture his brothers and sisters. Why? Because the Savior of the world came to be disenfranchised so that he could offer us life. And then he's saying, now walk in my footsteps. So if you can't see and serve the disenfranchised, then you are not seeing and serving Jesus or a part of his kingdom. So what does Paul tell us? Share life. Maybe another way to say this is when you extend kindness, compassion, and forgiveness, Jesus takes it personally. And when you don't, he takes that personally as well. It's as if you're doing it or withholding it from him. Uh, you, you might even go so far as to say that one of the markers of having life is that you share it. Now, I told you at the beginning of my message today that we were going to see if we could find the theme, the thread running through all of this. And I wonder if, if you have figured it out. So I, I, I'll just remind you, so far we have heard this. That Paul has said in these final three points of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians, he said, speak words of life to build others up. Live in such a way that honors God the Holy Spirit, and the sacrifice of Jesus, and extend the grace and compassion God gave you to other people around you. So the thread that is running through all of this, what Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, is the same message he sent when he wrote to the people in Philippians. In fact, in chapter 2 of the letter to the Philippians, he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interest of others. See, the kingdom of God is not something to be held on to. We have been given much. We've been given life eternal. And we're expected to give it away. To share life or as Jesus said, if you want to cut this down to the most simple version of everything that Paul is trying to communicate to us, we go back to the thing that Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Freely you have received, freely give. How do I know you've actually received? You'll give it away. How do I know that God has actually changed your heart? Because the words you offer to the people around you are designed to bring life instead of death and destruction. How do I know that God has really changed your life, that you really value his sacrifice for you? Because the actions that you take every single day think about Jesus before they think about your own comfort. So here's Paul's final point. Here's what Paul ultimately says as he ends this section that we call Ephesians chapter 4. If you truly are a child of God, you will consider God and other people in your speech, in your actions, and in the posture of your heart. Consider others before yourself. You see, we enter God's kingdom because Jesus put our comfort and livelihood above his own. We remain in God's kingdom by following in his footsteps, by doing the same for others. You didn't get here because God chose to be selfish. You won't stay in the kingdom because you choose to be selfish. 
But we have a world that is designed. I mean, you are living like the church, like the church in Ephesus, living in a world trying to influence you with the culture and the lies and the ways of making yourself comfortable. And, and, and if you just believe this thing, then you'll be popular. If you affirm or say or don't affirm or do, if you just say all the right words and believe all the right things and vote for all the right people and stuff and live in all the right ways and make sure you wear and look and live in just the right. We have a world trying to tell you how to be and God has already told you who you are. So this is relevant for us just as much as it was for the people in Ephesus. How do you remain in the kingdom of God? You be like Jesus. So let's move towards a response. In fact, I I want to invite you today to listen one more time to what Paul writes in these final words of Ephesians, the ones that we've been talking about today, just these few verses. I'm going to read this to you one more time. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. These questions are going to be designed to give you a moment to think about the state of your life and relationship with God, and then I'm going to give you a moment to pray. And this is how we're going to end our time together. But as you listen, I want you to listen specifically for what stands out to you today. What feels like a challenge or an invitation? Uh, Maybe another way to say this is, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you today? Not to your neighbor, not to your family, not to your employer to you. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? And so listen again to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. This is the word of the Lord. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit, You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So here are four questions I'd like to invite you to think about as we come to a conclusion today. First question, how is your language? Second question, does your life bring grief or joy to God? Third question, do you treat other people the way Jesus has treated you? And then fourth question, as you listen to a sermon like this today, is there a person that came to mind that you need to go have a conversation with? This conversation could look like a point of confession, could look like a point of restoration of relationship. Maybe I I need to repent or apologize for the things that I've said or the things that I did or didn't say or didn't do. So this, this question, by the way, is not an invitation to confrontation, but restoration. So who is God putting on my heart right now? Now, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray a blessing over us as that's how we traditionally end our services. I'm going to do that in just a moment. But before we do that, I would love for you to just take a moment in the, in the quiet of this space. I'm going to have these questions stay right here on the screen for you. You can look up at the screen. You can close your eyes, think and pray. What would, it, what would it look like for you just to take a moment to pray, to talk to God? Go ahead and do that now. If you want to close your eyes, if you want to just look up at the screen, if you need to write something in a journal or your phone as a reflection, if there's something you need to say to God, God, we come to you in prayer right now. So God, even now as my friends are taking a moment to pray, to talk with you, whatever business needs to be done in this moment, and whatever business is inspired to be done after this moment. And God, speak to us and hear us as we speak to you. Take another moment. We'll pray together to close our time.
God, we are grateful that your word is both encouraging and challenging. For the places today where we have felt convicted, we are thankful for that because we're reminded that you are a good father who corrects out of love when we are living outside of your love. We are thankful for the places where we feel corrected. We are incredibly thankful for the places where we feel encouraged. Where today, as we hear a message like this, we can feel peace. And, and, and if there's places in our lives where we heard you, Holy Spirit, say to us, hey, good job, keep doing that. God, we thank you for the validation and the affirmation that comes from your Holy Spirit as we are walking in your way. We're grateful for that. Lord, help us to hold these things in tension, to live in righteousness, to pursue you, to live more like you, and to be a blessing. And so, church, I would close our time today by praying this blessing over you. May your life bring great honor and joy to the God who died to give it to you. May your words speak life and blessing to those who hear you. May you be slow to anger, slow to speak, but quick to forgive. And may your actions be an overflow from a full heart that is at peace with God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.